Well, sometime last year, probably towards the end of the summer, I came across a quote that is attributed to a famous English preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Now, Spurgeon is one of the most influential preachers in history, and um, he uh, preached, they say, on average 13 times a week over the course of his ministry. He has millions of sermons that have actually been published. And uh, yet a third of the time that he was actually scheduled to preach, he had to find a substitute. Because Spurgeon suffered from severe and deep depression all throughout his life. He uh, battled serious gout and kidney diseases. On top of that, his wife was bedridden for 25 years of their marriage. And uh, then he had all the emotional uh, turmoil and stress and pain of the people that he was preaching to who opposed what he was saying, primarily his opposition to American slavery. Now, he writes about his life using this metaphor. He says, I've been cast into waters to swim in, which, but for God's upholding hand, would have proved waters to drown in. The waters rolled in continually, wave upon wave, I know the roll of the billows and the rush of the winds. And never were the promises of Jehovah so precious to me as at this hour. Some of them I never understood till now. I had not reached the date at which they matured, for I was not myself mature enough to perceive their meaning. Now, Spurgeon wrote those words when he was 53 years old. He passed away four years later. And when wave after wave of difficulty came, he says, I could have been crushed by it, I could have been swept away by it, I could have drowned, or as he says, and here's the quote, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages, which is a name for God, right? He's strong, he's solid, he's immovable. So I've been sitting on those words for at least six months now, and they've kind of been settling into me. And so when I start thinking about what do we want to teach in 2024 as a church, what's the direction I feel like maybe God wants you know, me to kind of steer things here. And I was praying through all that. I knew we needed to spend some time um, in this just to kind of sit in it. And for reasons, maybe I don't yet know. Okay. So we're just going to kind of trust that and go with it. But as I prayed through it, I thought about a lot of different possible directions that we could go with this. And I kept coming back to the same thing, the story of Job that you find in the Old Testament. Now, I just want to say I am excited um, about this in what I would consider to be a cautiously optimistic kind of a way. So it's a very weird kind of a way, okay? I just need you to know, okay, as a church, that we're about ready to jump into the deep end of the pool, if you know what I mean, okay? We're going to go where few people dare to actually go. And um, if you're looking for a series like some teaching in which like we get some very easy answers or we're going to get to the end of five weeks and we can put it in a nice package and put a bow on it and say, here you go, this probably isn't it, okay? I don't think that's going to happen for us. In complete transparency, I'll tell you that it's actually raised more questions for me now that I'm in the middle of it than when I started putting this all together. And so we're not going to shy away from that. I'm going to throw a bunch of questions at you um, week after week. But I would encourage you to maybe view this as maybe like a five-part docu-series. You know what I mean? Like each week is kind of good on its own, but it kind of builds on the one, you know, before and after it. And so today is probably not going to be resolved for you, but we're going to get a piece, okay? So Job's story is found creatively titled, anybody know this one, in the book of? Job. All right. Awesome. If you open up to the middle of your Bible, you'll probably be in Psalms. If you just turn to the left, the next book to the left is called Job. And Job is considered by a lot of people to be maybe the oldest piece of the scripture that we actually have um, in our Bible. And so the very first sentence, Job chapter one says, there was a man in the country of us named Job. He's a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep and goats, 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So very affluent guy, okay, big family. We got 10 kids. I love those phrases that describe him, complete integrity. He feared God and he turned away from evil. It even says right there in the end, Job is basically the greatest man alive, right? He's an all around awesome guy, 
with an amazing life. And when we read on, it says he has an awesome family. His sons used to take turns having banquets at their homes. They'd send an invitation to their sisters to eat and drink with them. So his kids liked each other, okay? They enjoyed hanging out. Whenever a round of banqueting was over, I just think that's a funny phrase. When a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them. Rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them, for Job thought, okay, I don't know really what happened at this banquet. Maybe my children have sinned. Maybe they even on the inside cursed in their thoughts or their hearts, God. This was Job's regular practice. Now, what I want you to notice about all that, there's a lot happening there, but Job's an awesome dad. That's what I take away from it. I mean, he is praying for them. He's praying to God about them. He was like a priest, right? He's functioning like a priest for his family. He's constantly going before God on behalf of his family. So that's our introduction to Job, okay? And then it's like we just cut away to an entirely other scene, okay? So if you are my age or you grew up watching the amazing cartoons of years past, this is where we would read in our Bible, meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice or something like that, okay? It says, one day the sons of God, which I think seems to be a reference to angels, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan... Da, 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 also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? Oh, just roaming the earth, walking around on it. <laughs> now listen, you're going to have to do some hard work in this series. <laughs> and this is one of those areas right here. Satan says, you know what? I just been hanging out, just been walking around on the earth, which probably makes for a pretty cool movie, but I'm teaching this, okay, and each person who takes the stage, and we're believing that this is actually what happened, or I would even suggest still happens, okay? So we know other places that he is roaming around like a lion, and he's actually looking for someone to prey upon. Then the Lord said to Satan, okay, well, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him. Again, man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. So more amazing descriptors. Now, I just want to throw out a maybe to you, okay? Just maybe, and I'm kind of making this up on my own here, but maybe God actually presents Job because he knows that Job will pass whatever test is about to be placed in front of him. Maybe, just making it up, okay? Maybe God is actually sparing another unsuspecting person who's actually weak in their faith and will fail. We don't know, just throwing it out there. We do know that God is the one who suggests Job. Now this conversation will actually make you stop and think, I'm gonna summarize for you what takes place from this point on because this right here is actually so important that we're gonna devote all of next week to this conversation that takes place. But here's how it goes, Satan's cynical. He basically says, hey, if you take something away from your boy, okay, he'll turn on you. He only loves you, okay, because you, you're good to him. And God says, okay, you have, you have my permission to interfere in his life but you can't hurt him, you can't hurt him. And Job's family's at one of their parties, right? We have some raiders who come in and they attack and all of his livestock, they kill his servants. Another group comes in and takes over his property and they kill more of his servants. And then during one of these dinner parties, something like a tornado comes through, takes out the entire house and his entire family dies together. And it's an understatement, okay, to say that obviously Job is devastated but you read this in verse 22, throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. And I'll say not yet, okay. When you turn over to chapter two, you almost read the exact same scenario taking place. A conversation in heaven continues that's completely unknown to Job. And it's God saying, I told you, I knew it, he would pass your test. It actually says in chapter two, verse three, he still retains his integrity even though you incited me against him to destroy him, and you better pay attention to this phrase and decide what you think, to destroy him for no good reason. Satan's going, okay, fine, you won round one, let's raise the stakes a little bit, let me test him physically. Like some of us know firsthand, like the pain of the physical 
you know, whatever's happening in our body, right, in our life, that pain weakens our resistance and it makes everything else worse. Again, God goes, okay, I will give you permission to do this, do it, whatever you want to do, but I won't let you take his life. And what the story records for us is that over the next couple of chapters, Job experiences intense pain into his bones, his skin turned black and peeled, erupting sores. He was emaciated. He lived with a constant fever, deep depression, weeping, sleepless nights and nightmares, rotting teeth, sores over his entire body, difficulty breathing, a deep drive to scratch off every inch of his skin. He's literally dying inside. It says his breath is so bad, his wife wants nothing to do with him. Okay. She's in his ear constantly, okay? She's in his ear going, hey, why don't you just tell God off? And Job's response, should we accept only good from God and not adversity? In other words, hey, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna thank God for giving us all the good, so maybe there could be some gifts in the bad. Chapter 2, 10, throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Hey, in rapid succession, I just want to make sure you understand, Job lost all his livestock, his servants, his wealth, and his 10 kids on the same day. And then on top of that, he lost his health. Now, I have known people, some of them are you, are in previous services this morning, who have overcome economic ruin. Right, some of us have overcome the crushing loss of a family member or multiple family members that we've lost in a close amount of time. People who maybe have um, battled back against depression or disease or pain like this one, but I've never encountered anyone on this particular kind of scale like Job who experienced utter desolation in every area of life simultaneously. Which likely, okay, if you're hearing it or you're reading it, would make every single one of us ask the exact same question. Why? <laughs> I mean, why does Job, the best man around, suffer like this? I mean, specifically, why do bad things like this happen to good people like Job or me? Because that's not just a question that Job has, right? That's a question that you have. And you have it because you have a story, don't you? Like you have a story of something that's happened to you in the past or you have a story of something that you're going through right now. And I'm not even going to try to take the time today to suggest what you might be going through right now because you know what? You know, don't you? Like you know if you're going through something in your life, the question we all have in those moments is why? Now I would just venture to guess, okay, that that is probably most often asked question of God. Hey, why, why is this happening to me? By the way, sometimes the reason is you made a really bad decision, right? <laughs> I mean, you did it and you're actually suffering consequences. Or sometimes the bad in our life is because somebody else made that bad decisions and it's kind of falling on us. Or sometimes what we're experiencing is just coincidence, right? Just, just happened, right? That's, that. Sometimes, though, we even know that God has designed things to take place to shape us and grow us. But none of those seem to be a good reason for Job. It seems like a senseless suffering, okay, not as a punishment, but precisely because Job is so good. Why does Job, okay, who is described as the best person in the whole world, the most righteous, the guy who loves God the most, have to suffer the most? When you read the next 40 chapters of his story, okay, and you get to the end of chapter 42, we expect to get an answer, don't we? Spoiler alert, we don't. <laughs> we don't know why. We don't know why Job gets no answers to his questions. But here is the most important thing I could ask you to lean into to this point. Job has to choose whether or not to trust God without having all of the information. An author by the name of Philip Yancey actually says that the story of Job is essentially laid out like a mystery play. Okay, so before the whole thing begins, we, we all get invited to go backstage and we're, we're listening to the director talk about the plot, right? And the, the storylines and the main characters. And he even tells us in advance, right, who does what and why they do it. In fact, everything is actually solved for us in that pre-meeting about what we're gonna see except one thing, which is how does the main character, okay, respond? Like, will Job actually trust God or deny him? 
So then when the curtain actually rises and we see the actors on the stage who have no knowledge whatsoever what the director has actually told us when we were gathered backstage. Like we know the answer, okay, to the mystery questions, but the star, he's like a detective, okay, Job does not. And he's going to spend his entire time on stage trying to discover what we all already know. Okay, why me? What did I do wrong? Right? To us, okay, the audience, we learned the answers backstage. Or in this case, in the first two chapters. What did Job do wrong? Nothing. He's the best of the best. So why is he suffering, right? Well, it's not a punishment. He's actually selected to play the lead role because he is so good. Well, we know, okay, that Job does not, is that this is the result of a wager between God and Satan. Excited about that? If, okay, we could come to the place, okay, where we accept that we may never get the answers that we're looking for about our lives. If we could come to that place and accept that, then we can ask a new question, which is, can I trust God? Can I trust God, okay, no matter how things appear at the time? And whether it's Job's story, okay, or whether it's your story, I, I want to offer three things, hopefully, just to keep in mind that are at work in your story. And I think these will be a good framework for us going forward to maybe understand Job's story or as a way to maybe view your own life, okay? So here's the first one that's at work. There's two worlds, okay? There are two worlds. When God gets his chance to address Job towards the end of this story, he actually reminds him of something either we've never heard before or something that we've forgotten. There are two worlds at play. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, and we can't do all of that in a couple of minutes, but I think you all can handle this. This looks like the smartest group this morning. The scriptures actually, from beginning to end, okay, actually paint a picture for us that present a tension that we have to manage. Okay, long, long ago, all right, before you and I were here, there was a war between good and evil or a war between God and Satan in which, got to understand, a winner has already been declared, right? God has already been declared the winner in a battle that's already been fought. And yet what we have to manage here is there continue to be skirmishes here right now. And there will then be one more final battle, right, in the future, in the end, where God will retain his crown. So you could think about it this way. God won, okay, he's winning, and, and he will win. Let me try to explain why maybe that's important for you, okay? We use a streaming service for live TV. Anybody else do that? Okay, well, there's this whole new thing out there called, never mind. <laughs> So this happened recently, okay? I, I, I'm watching a game, I get up to do something, I don't even remember what it was, and I hit pause. You ever done that? And it takes me a while to actually get back to my place on the couch, and, and I'm forgetting that I'm several minutes behind. I just start watching again, and I assume, okay, this is what's happening, right? And, and then I get an alert on my phone that tells me the game is over. Has this ever happened to anybody before? And because I'm just like, I look at everything that pops up, I look at it and I go, well, crap, that, that, that's not what I wanted to happen. Sometimes, okay, my YouTube is actually slightly behind, even if I feel like I'm, I'm live, okay? And so a while back, I get an alert on my phone that actually says the game is over and um, gives me the final score and I'm going, but there's still 13 seconds left on my TV. So I don't know if that's happened to y'all before. Or I'll receive a text from my son, okay? And he'll say, wow, what an ending. Or he'll say, did you see that dunk? And I'm like, I did not see a dunk. Apparently it's coming up, okay, here in a second. Here's what I found, okay? When you already know the outcome, it changes how you watch the game. See, when you know how it ends, okay, you participate differently. Like, I know we win, I get it, but I don't know how. Like, I don't know what it took to actually make that happen. In this case, we're saying we know how the story ends. Listen, God wins. And knowing that, okay, listen, Satan fights from a position of defeat. And he wants to, and it seems is allowed to, to some degree, cause as much havoc as possible in the meantime. Which means he is not sitting around idly, he's developing strategies to disrupt your life. 
Listen, when the Chiefs and the Niners play in the Super Bowl next Sunday, I know y'all thought it was an off week, but we got to say it, okay? <laughs> They're going to say things all week long, like, boy, two teams go into battle, or this one's going to be a war, you know? And what they're talking about is we have two teams that are going to play who up to that point have been strategizing, right, for two weeks. They're drawing on the whiteboard. They're running scenarios. They're building offensive and defensive schemes. They've been watching video of their opponent, right? What do they do? Right? What are they going to do? Where might they exploit us? What are their weaknesses? What are our strengths, right? They've given long hours, like all-nighters, right, sleepless moments, right, looking for the slightest advantage, going, okay, we, we have a plan that we think is actually going to work. And the team that can do their thing, right, the best and the most consistent and repeat it will have the best chance to win. Listen, Satan is relentless like that. All he thinks about is diverting your attention, distracting you from the good that God has for you and destroying the work of God in your life. He has been up all night long in the war room strategizing. Like he's holding meetings and I assume called the temple of doom. Okay, Carl, let's go up to the big board, right? Who do we have here? Throw the next picture up there, right? Who's that guy? What do we know about him? One of the things that we learn about Job's story is that the natural world and the spiritual world seem to interact with one another and influence one another on a daily basis. When God finally addresses Job in the final few chapters, God chooses not only to not answer his questions about why, he also chooses to not even talk about how things really work in this world. He talks about how things work in another world that Job can't possibly understand. Which leads us to believe, you know what, we probably have no business or chance or qualifications of actually figuring out why things happen the way they do or how the world works. It's a framework, okay? There's two worlds at play. There's also two characters, okay? There's, there's you and there's God. And the amazing thing is it's possible to actually have a relationship of trust based on things that I know about God and based on my experiences with God. Think about it this way. Tomorrow morning, you're scheduled to have coffee with your best friend at 8.30. At 8.30, they're not there. At 8.35, they're not there. At 8.40, at 8.45, they're still not there. Now, you can choose to believe one of two things about that person. One, you could think, okay, wow, that's really rude. Or you could think, you know what? Something must have happened. Okay, I can't reach them. They didn't contact me. Some, there must be an explanation. Listen, my assumption about people that I know and really love and care about and have a good track, track record with is to believe the best about the situation. Think about God. So if God actually chooses to act differently than I think he should, like do I just naturally think that God must not be listening or that he's not loving or that he must not even be aware or do I draw on the mountain of evidence that I have from a book like the scriptures, from my own experience that actually tells me, oh no, God actually hears every, everything from me. God actually is loving and compassionate and he will be with me no matter what, right? Even in the darkness, even if the pain and the loss doesn't go away. So even though I can have this relationship, I must understand that we're not the same. <laughs> We're just, we're not the same. We're not equals. Again, when God finally answers Job in the end of the story, he points out the big difference that exists between the creator and the created. So when it comes to how God actually governs the world, like we tend, maybe this is me, we tend to expect God to do things the way that we would, or at least the way we think we would do them. And then when he doesn't, we feel let down. Listen, if I'm really honest with you this morning, I don't do very well the things that are actually under my control. I have a check engine light on my car. It's been there for months. I got a water softener in my garage that just keeps telling me it's going home and it can't find home, okay? And I just leave it there and I don't really do anything. And yet, okay, there are still times when I stand here and I think, you know what? I understand how the universe should actually be managed. I mean, we somehow think we know how God should treat terrible people and, 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 you know, humble them or run interference on evil plans or reward really good people like me. And we assume that God arranges events like we would. And then we draw what I would consider to be faulty conclusions about those things. Okay, God must not love me or God isn't fair or God can't do it. 
It's a difficult thing to admit, okay, but I am a limited, time-bound, blind to the realities of how things work human. Who still lashes out against someone who is not? We want God to be like us, right? And he's not. And we are so different, okay? The Bible doesn't choose to describe our relationship as friendship. It actually describes the relationship as worship, which is why faith, okay, is what happens when we choose to trust God with whatever we can muster up without answers. I hope you realize otherwise it wouldn't be faith, right? So if I don't go to my grave with a little bit of confusion and a few questions still on my heart and my mind, I probably don't go to my grave really trusting in God. So two worlds, two characters, let's end here, two promises. I'm gonna jump over and let Jesus take this one, okay, because he's smarter than me. Because he said there are two things you can count on in your life. He said, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace, okay, that's number one. Number two, you will have suffering in this world. That's exciting, but be courageous. I've conquered the world. Now, Jesus was a much better teacher than me, a lot smarter than me, but if I was to roll this out for you, I think he got him out of order. I'd rather work backwards, right? Hey, you're gonna have some trouble in this world. It's a guarantee, right? Your life is gonna be challenging. Things are gonna be difficult. You're gonna have a bad day, you're gonna have a bad week, you're gonna have a bad month, anyone having a bad year or a series of bad years that are connected, right? In this life, Jesus said, that's just the way it is. That's the way it works. But second promise, right, is that in the midst of all of that, he says, you can actually have peace in me, in Jesus. Why? Because he says, look, I've overcome this world where we are bound and living. I beat it. I will defeat it in this world which our suffering exists. Listen, this is part of what Spurgeon meant when he said we can actually learn to kiss the wave of difficulty if we allow it to lead us to Jesus, the immovable and solid rock. Let me show you a picture of this guy. Many of you will know him. This is Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly is a quarterback of the Buffalo Bills, actually led them to four consecutive Super Bowls back in the 90s. We got a lot of Buffalo Bills fans in the church, and I promised I would not draw a whole lot of attention to the fact that he didn't win any of them, but he was a very successful guy and a very good player, you know, has a lot of great stats, a lot of great accomplishments on the field. He actually was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2002. So tons of success for this guy on the field. Off the field, he had a ton of difficulty in his life. 1997, a year after he retired from the NFL, his infant son Hunter was diagnosed with what turned out to be a terminal illness, right? Led to his death in 2005. 2013, right? Jim got diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma in and out of the hospital years worth of that. God declared cancer free, which lasted for three years. Then he announced cancer had returned. And now after many surgeries, he's declaring cancer free again. He has had what I would describe wave after wave of suffering in his life. What I want you to know is though, is that it actually led him to something solid faith in Jesus. This past fall, Jim actually announced that he had been baptized, okay, a few months ago, and he's wearing this t-shirt that says, God's real. <laughs> and I want to read what his wife wrote that day, given what you already know about his life and what he's been through. She writes, I've witnessed God at work in this man's life for over 30 years, and I can tell you that God isn't just real. Again, wave after wave of suffering, listen to how she describes God. He is faithful, trustworthy, kind, loving, compassionate, powerful, gracious, good, merciful, forgiving, and so much more. He's immeasurably more than we can imagine. He is everything. Hey, they found an answer to the question and you gotta find an answer to the question. Can I trust God no matter how things appear at the time? 
Hey, as wave after wave, right, comes and crashes into your life, I pray that we would learn and be led to, as it says in Isaiah 26, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. So when we were kind of putting all this together and planning the weeks and we just hit pause and I was like, you know, like there's gonna be a lot that gets stirred up, I think every week. So we want a different way to maybe respond, okay? So Jared's gonna play for us a bit. We'll worship like we normally do at the end and send you out that way. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know, take communion. It's in the back of the seat in front of you. You know all about that. But I just wanted to do something a little bit different and create some space for someone to pray over you. Okay, so I'm gonna say a prayer here in just another minute. And when I say amen, there's magically gonna be a couple of people standing down front, okay? And if you're here today and you're like, you know what? I don't understand what's happening or this is difficult. I need someone to help carry this load, share this burden. I need someone to pray for me. Then I would just simply invite you over the course of the next several minutes to walk down front and let someone pray over you. This is not counseling, by the way. Can you put it in a sentence or two maybe? And if you're like, boy, I need deep therapy, let's do that afterwards. But can you just say, hey, you know, it's just going difficult in my life right now and this happened to me and would you pray for me? And we would love to do that for you today. So let me pray and then, uh, then we'll do that today. God, this morning, today, we just say thank you for these words, this story of Job. God, that I'm... Um, weirdly excited about, I guess, that we might uncover in the next several weeks what it looks like to truly place our faith in you when maybe we don't understand that's happening around us. God, today we just simply want to declare as much as we can muster up today that we trust you, that we want to count on you to be that solid and immovable, consistent rock. And we're going to pray these things in your name. Amen.